Okay, we're, to stay on time, we're going to go ahead and get started with the uh, final session of, the, of today. Uh, we have two uh, great talks lined up, two great speakers. Uh, the first speaker is somebody who needs no introduction, but let me introduce him anyway. Uh, briefly, uh, Pierre Baldi in our computer science department, organizer of this event. And uh, suffice to say, Pierre is very much a Renaissance man. Uh, he's a lot of great research in, in uh, machine learning, bioinformatics. And I've been told he's also going to be playing music at the reception later on. So, without uh, <laughs> further ado, I'll hand over to Pierre. Thank you, Boric. <laughs> Okay, we're going to switch gears here a little bit and look at uh, AI in the, in the future. But before I get there, let me just say a few words about what Marius announced this morning. We have this new AI Institute, campus-wide institute, and the vision is to organize the institute around four pillars or four thrusts. One is uh, foundations, machine learning, the mathematics of AI, essentially. A second thrust is applications, and today you have an example of that, applications to the biomedical space. Of course, with AI come a lot of uh, ethical, legal, societal, economical issues, so we want also that uh, to be an important pillar in partnership with the School of Law, etc. But the pillar I'm going to talk to you today about is the, f the last one, which is neuroscience and natural intelligence. Um, it is, of course, an area of application of, of AI, but it's also an area of inspiration, and that's uh, what is going to be in my talk. So briefly, I'll go over what AI can do today, how we got here, what AI cannot do, and some thought about how we can uh, think about future direction for AI, especially in the long term, because as a university, we are interested in, in the AI of tomorrow morning, but also in the AI 5, 10, 15 down, years down the road. So what can you do with AI today? You have seen a lot of examples. In particular, you can have applications in neuroscience. The brain is a very complex system. You, can, um, uh, you have techniques, technologies today to measure the behavior of the brain at all scales. From the, you can do RNA-seq on, on single uh, pyramidal cells, for instance all the way to imaging. So this is an example of an of a imaging project we did with, uh, with uh, Daniel Cho, who spoke this morning uh, on, on brain imaging. But what I want to show you is a slightly different project on colonoscopy. Now, you may think this has nothing to do with neuroscience, but I have uh, some news for you. You, have, you. you learned your anatomy in the wrong book. The colon is part of the brain. This is the new anatomy. The reason is that uh, in the colon you have a microbiome and we, fi we are finding uh, more and more that there are very important interactions between the brain and the microbiome. For instance, we, 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 uh, we, we know now that Parkinson's disease is uh, very much connected to the, to the microbiome. So anyway, what I sh I'm showing to you now is a video. It's a collage of several video clips, and you will see the AI developed by one of my graduate students, uh, Gregor Herman, who is here, uh, automatically finding polyps in these videos and putting bounding boxes around the polyps. And overall, this works very well. It's roughly at, at uh, human level performance. It's a uh, version of this is being used in the uh, UCI hospital. You get the picture. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is this. Uh, what is perception, essentially? Recognize objects in images, or maybe uh, recognizing speech or music genre, etc. Those sort of perceptual tasks are, are a relative result, not 100%, but by and large, they are solved by the AI that is available today. So example of things you may think are not solved are things like reasoning. And there you have, you have to be careful, because there are certain reasoning tasks that actually AI can solve very well using the same techniques. So here's an example of another um, project done by my student on the Rubik's Cube and many other combinatorial puzzles 
where um, you can scramble the Rubik cube, the Rubik's cube, and the system can compute automatically compute a solution for solving the cube and puts it together. So in some sense, the system is reasoning about this this puzzle, which is very uh, very mathematical and and actually not not very easy to do for humans, especially if you don't know the tricks for for putting it back together. And this is again learned automatically using deep something called deep reinforcement learning. But basically the same techniques as, as, uh, as for the coronoscopy in some way. So how did we get here? Well, it started roughly in the 1940s where people, I'm not going to go through all these people, but if you look at what we knew about the brain in the 1940s, all the basic concepts were in place. Uh, brain areas, Broca, synapses, Sherrington, uh, anatomy, Ramon y Cajal, uh, electrical signal between neurons, etc. And McCulloch and Pitts and others were the first to try to create very simple models of neurons, and they came up with this model, which is what we're using today in our neural networks, essentially. So this model was already available around uh, 1945 or so. Um, Jubel and Wiesels in the 60s were doing recordings from the cats and discovered that uh, in the early visual areas, V1, V2, etc., you have arrays of feature detectors, for instance, neurons capable of detecting bars at different orientations, etc., etc. And so by the end of the 70s, we already had the idea of what is called today a convolutional neural network, which is what we use to do these colonoscopies, for instance. So it's basically an artificial neural network made of the kinds of neurons I just described to you, organized in layers, where within the layers, all the neurons have, have a, a similar, performed similar operation, have similar weight. So this is Fukushima, which, who came up with this um, uh, type of architectures. It was called the Neocognitron at the time. The paper came out in 1980. He made one big mistake. He said, we can learn the connections between the weights between the layers using Heb rule. We have showed a few years ago that actually cannot work. It's not possible to, to learn this architecture if you use Heb rule. You need a different al algorithm, which is essentially gradient descent, which was developed by, by various people in the late 70s, 80s. It's an algorithm that allows you to train a, a deep neural network with many layers. If you have an error function that looks at the mismatch between the performance of the network and, and the targets, you can take the gradient of this error function, propagate the gradient through the layers, and adjust the weights by gradient descent. So it's a very simple idea. It's something that, that Newton could have done. But it works very well. And we knew that already in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, we were using convolutional neural network. This is a Siamese convolutional neural network by, by today's terminology applied for fingerprint recognition. A uh, more famous application was to um, handwritten digits by, by Lecan and Bell Labs. But we knew that these things were working very well. We just didn't have a lot of data and a lot of computing power, and that's what has changed today. We have GPUs. We have uh, very often very large uh, data sets. And the other thing that has changed is the software libraries. Companies like Google or Facebook are maintaining uh, you know, professional, very nice, robust libraries that allow you to deploy these systems uh, fairly easily today. And so the colonoscopy example is something that even undergraduates in, in, in our classes now are, are capable of, of, of doing. So that's what we can do. Things like perception, you have probably use uh, Google Translate, you have used Alexa or Siri, you know that uh, AI can solve chess, Go, the Rubik's Cube, and there are self-driving cars, recommender systems, etc. Things that AI cannot do today is general purpose AI, so-called general AI. Things like reasoning, planning, very difficult mathematics, but again, you have to be very careful because you can do the Rubik's Cube, you can do automatic differentiation, etc. Uh, composition of interesting novels, music, etc. Again, you have to be careful. There are systems that can produce somewhat interesting text, for instance, and uh, understanding language and passing the, the Turing test. As you move closer and closer to these boundaries, things get fuzzier and fuzzier. So again, the Rubik's Cube or, or a system that plays Go is, is somewhat in, in, a, in, a, in this uh, fuzzy zone 
where these systems are reasoning in some way, but this is something AI can do today. So a common way of, of, of uh, explaining the boundary is to say that current methods can do interpolate, can do interpolation, and what you really want to do in the future is to do extrapolation. It's a nice metaphor, it's useful, but if you think about it carefully, it's also a little bit silly. Because if you think about a child raised in, a, in an American family, he can certainly understand the Canadian English or Australian English or British English, and that's interpolation, but he cannot understand Chinese. So he can, you cannot extrapolate from one language to a completely different language instantaneously. The distance is too big. So when you talk about extrapolation, what you really have to come up with are metrics, how far you want to go outside of sort of your training set, and how much computational time do you have to do so? Because you can learn Chinese. It's just going to take you four or five years, right? So again, this is useful, but it's not a very, very precise um, uh, definition of where the boundary is. So how do we build the next generation of AI system? What are some of the possibilities? I'm going to describe what I think are the three main directions one, one can take or one can think of. And the first one is the hybrid idea. And basically, it's the idea that uh, we don't need biology. The, the only interesting things that biology has are neurons. We have those simple neural, neuronal models. And learning. We have machine learning. So we, we have taken all the interesting things from biology. And now we're going to continue in a completely uh, digital uh, um, hybrid way. Uh, artificial way. Um, the brain use very, uses very sloppy hardware. The neurons have response times of milliseconds. We have transistors in the nanosecond range. We don't need biology, right? You don't need all, all the details of neurons are probably doing other things on computing. Neurons have to live for p very long periods, maybe 100 years, right? That requires all kinds of things that, that are not relevant for, for AI. <clears throat> so forget the brain. We're going to do things artificially. So proponent of this direction is less valiant at Harvard. And the idea, the basic idea there is we're going to, for reasoning, we just use logic. We understand logic, et cetera. So we, the only thing we have to do is to combine logic with machine learning. And that's how we're going to be able to do reasoning and build the next generation of intelligent systems. So it's, it's an interesting idea. It's worth uh, trying, but so far it has not worked. People have, uh, there have been some attempt, attempts in simple situations, block worlds, etc. cetera, um, but it has not worked. Uh, one of the problem is uh, scaling. There are serious issues of scaling. I think also it has been tried on the wrong problem. So I, I think a, a great problem where you should try this is uh, chemistry, chemical reaction. It's a very nice world. It's very symbolic. So that's an area where perhaps uh, an approach like this uh, could be tried. But it's definitely a direction that some people are, are uh, interested in and, and worth taking. Another direction is scaling. It's to say, well, we do reasoning. We have the Rubik's Cube. We can do go better than humans. Basically, AI is solved. All we need is more GPUs, more training, more data. We just need to scale things up. After all, the brain has a very large number of neurons, very large number of connections, more than the GPUs we have on, 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 on this campus, for instance, uh, completely different regimes. So we just need to, to continue. Maybe there are a few tricks to, to be learned on the way, but these methods are going to ultimately um, solve the, the problems of general AI. So that's the scaling approach. And then there is a third direction which is related to the fourth pillar of the AI Institute, which is to say that, well, maybe there is still something to be learned from the brain. Um, evolution has spent a lot of time uh, creating the human brain. It has probably uh, uh, encountered or discovered a number of tricks that we still have not uh, been able to distill and to use in our systems. And so perhaps we should pay attention to biology in, in designing the next generation of AI systems. And so if you think in that direction, the question is, you know, what features of the brain should we look at that perhaps are, 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 are important in, in, 
in building, for building the next generation of, of AI systems. And it's a difficult question because, of course, the, the brain is very messy, it's full of details, it's full of things that have nothing to do with uh, building intelligence, and so it's very easy to get lost in the different types of neurons, in the physiology of neurons, et cetera, et cetera. So you really want to remain at some high level uh, and, and, and discard a lot of details, but you want to do it in the right way. So let me try to take you a little bit down that path and, and just pro provide some, some, uh, some, some ideas of what could be done. And for that, I want you to do a mental experiment. Think about an alien from a distant galaxy, a very advanced civilization, they're way beyond general AI, and this alien is coming to this planet, to planet Earth, and the task is to report on the status of computing, of intelligence on planet Earth to the distant planet. What would the alien say? Any guesses? Actually, the alien exists. I just met him this morning. This is the alien. His name is Johnny. And this is Johnny coming to planet Earth and looking at computing and intelligence on planet Earth. What would he say? Well, if you think about computing, about intelligence, I think it's fair to say that uh, you know, uh, intelligent processing systems, they have to do two things. They have to compute, and they have to be able to store information. You have to be able to store in intermediate results of computations. You have to be able to store knowledge over long periods of time. So you have these two dimensions are essential, no matter what the computing system is. And then, so if we look at the computing axis and you look at what kind of computing systems or hardware we have on this planet, you see that there is really two types. There is carbon-based computing, which is biological systems, cells all the way to brains, and then there is silicon-based computing, which is our computer, cell phones, supercomputer cluster, GPUs, etc. There are other things like quantum computing on the horizon, et cetera, but by and large, what you have today is these two classes of, of computing systems. Now, if you look on the storage side and thinking again about carbon-based computing and, 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 and uh, uh, silicon-based computing, you note that there are two different ways of storing information that are very different. One is the Turing style, the Turing tape, where you have a physical system which, are, which has a, an array of discrete addresses, which is what you have in your computer, right? That's the Turing tape. That's why the Turing model, Turing machine is so important for computer science, uh, right there. But there you have, the, you have also the neural style of, of the storing information, which is, you know, in vague terms, take information then scatter it across large numbers of, of, of synaptic weights. And it's very uh, interesting to look at how we got here. So life started about 3.8 billion years ago, and the first thing it discovered is the Turing style of storage, which is DNA. DNA is a very, very long tape. It's discrete, and it has distinct locations where you have genes, enhancers, promoters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And about 500 million years ago, you can see the beginning of the first uh, neurons, the first uh, very primitive brains, the first primitive nervous systems, etc. And then the human brain built over the last uh, million year or so, 10 million years. These, these numbers, of course, are not, not very precise. Then the human brain produces Turing, inventor of the Turing machine, <laughs> right? The most amazing thing about this is that Turing came up with a Turing model while thinking about the brain. It's, it's a very, very interesting, um, strange turn of, 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 of the history of computing. And then McCulloch and Pitts, for instance, and others that came up with this idea of artificial neurons, which are now important on, the, on this column. So silicon-based computing started about 100 years ago using the Turing model. It has evolved over the last uh, 100 years. And of course, today AI is here where we're using this, this idea of neural style and neurons, but we're do, doing it in a digital world, which is very strange and has also some, some uh, consequences. And there are also efforts of building so-called neuromorphic chips, which are closer in terms of hardware to the neural style of storing information. So that's a really high level view of how we got here. 
But something very strange happened in this story, and this is what I think tells us, gives us a direction for the future, which is this. Over the last, let's say, 200,000 years, the brain, the human brain, started going backwards toward the Turing style. And by this I mean, for instance, the invention of language. Language, if you take English, it's about 200,000 words. Think about 200,000 words as a Turing tape where you have 200,000 addresses or pointers. These addresses, they point to some electrical activity. When you say the word cat, it produces some electrical activity in the brain. In a different individual, the electrical activity will be slightly different, but the two, uh, the two individuals can communicate. So basically, language, you can view it as a system of shared addresses between um, members of a species or of, of, a, of, a, of a community. But it's definitely a digital way, in some way, of storing information. And so, of course, the obvious first challenge you see there is how do we, we implement some kind of Turing-style storage in the brain? So what I'm getting at, I think, is that storage is, how storage is done in the brain, I think, is one of the most interesting questions and one that, that uh, can give us the most insights for, for new types of, of AI um, in the future. So there is the implementation of the Turing, Turing uh, st tape, Turing style of, of storing information in the brain. What's the size of the tape in the brain? It's in the million. You can learn two or three languages in your life. Some people learn five, etc. So if each, each language is about 200,000 words, you get about one million or a few million addresses. There are anomalies of the tape or, or diseases of the, of the Turing tape in the brain. In fact, Jim Magot here at UCI has discovered a very strange type of, of human beings. There is about 300 in the US, so one in a million roughly, who um, have this interesting property that if you ask them, what were you doing on February 25th, uh, 2012, in the morning, oh, they will tell you, I was having breakfast, I was eating cornflakes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are people that are indexing their life day by day and remembering their life in that way. Well, that's a Turing type of storage of, 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 of the information, right? And if you think about it, your life is not that long, it's about 30,000 days. So they're just using 30,000 addresses of, of the Turing tape that is running in, in, in their brain. And of course, in the 80s, there, there, were, um, there was something called the Oddfield model, which I think is, uh, could be brought back to bear on this question on how to build the you know, Turing style of storage in, 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 uh, in neural systems, but uh, I won't get into those details. Another direction that has also to do with memory is that could, be, uh, could provide directions of research for, for the next generation of AI is the issue of short-term memory and something, a theory that has been called the global workspace theory that I will describe to you in a second. Um, but basically, what, what one of the questions you're thinking about is when you read a sentence or you read a paragraph, you have, and you arrive at the end of that paragraph, for instance, you have to remember the beginning of the paragraph in order to understand the sentence. So you must have stored the information of the beginning of the paragraph somewhere in the brain. And the question is, in which substrate do you store it? Do you store it in the electrical activity of neurons, or do you store it in, in fast synapses? I think you can make an argument that actually it's probably stored in fast synapses, which is a mechanism that is not present in current uh, deep learning methods, and suggest adding these mechanisms to current neural networks to increase their um, capabilities. So this uh, global workspace theory uh, can be explained using the so-called theater metaphor. There is many, several neuroscientists and even computer scientists that are behind this now. And this is the idea, is that your brain works like a theater. Think of every person in this theater as a processor. You have a lot of processors in the audience which are completely unconscious, right? When you see things, you are completely unconscious of how your brain is you know, parsing edges in images and objects, etc. So it's done by these guys here. 
Even when you are speaking, you're not conscious on, of how the words are coming to you. They're just bubbling to the surface, but you don't know where they come from. So that's also done by these guys here. And then you have a stage, which is where consciousness takes uh, place, where you have very few players, you have a short-term memory that, cannot, uh, that has very limited capacity, where you have a searchlight of attention that focuses, the, uh, focuses your attention, your awareness. And this stage is connected to the rest of the brain, all the other parts of the brain. Uh, so this idea of a common uh, workspace of a common scratch pad over where you are conscious, where intermediary um, results, calculations can, 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 can take place, is nowhere present in systems, in the system that I showed you today. We don't have that. And it's something that uh, I think uh, could be explored. And uh, Bloom, for instance, Manuel Bloom is, is, uh, is uh, seriously considering about building computer architectures that have these, uh, these kinds of features. Oh, out of time. Um, and then the third direction, which is also uh, related to storage, is the idea of dynamic uh, knowledge graphs. So there have been attempts to store information in, in graphs rather than in databases. In fact, if you look at the 70s, when the databases, uh, uh, the idea of databases was created, there were two models at the time, one that was built, built based on networks, and one was built on, on tables and joins, etc. And the, the model on tables and joins is the model that won at the time, and, and uh, served us very well. But it doesn't mean that the uh, network model, where entities are connected through complex graphs is not something we should look at and perhaps revisit. And if you think about how things are stored long-term in, 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 in the brain, and you talk to neuroscientists and go to their talks, etc., you see that there are all kinds of interesting uh, phenomena that happen, for instance, in connection to circadian rhythms and what happens during the night where you, you have some uh, replay occurring and dreaming that allows that is believed to have a, a, an important role in dynamically changing these connections in these graphs where you're storing, storing knowledge. So again, this is something else that is not present in current uh, systems today, and that could be useful to build a um, you know, system that have a better knowledge of the world and can, can, can come closer to this uh, sort of goal of general AI that uh, we envision. Um, some of the students, uh, Gregor Urban did the colonoscopy stuff. The Rubik's Cube is done by Alexander Forrest, who will be playing music later, and Steve, who is here. So I thank them very much. They have also built, they want me to make this announcement, I'm sorry, but uh, I have to do it. They built a new system that allows to do competitions of different intelligent agents trained by reinforcement learning. So we, we're going to have these competitions, and uh, this is some announcement. You can try the beta versions here at uh, this address, and there will be a, a, an official com competition in the fall, where you have different agents trained by reinforcement learning competing in uh, this environment. Thank you very much. Time for one quick question before we move to the next speaker. Sorry. I was thinking about the, the concept of virtualization. Is on? You didn't really Can you mention yeah, that. Or, you um, how would that fit into all of this? Because it, it, it's all over your, your square. That, that one system is imitating another and... Right, so it, it is, uh, I mean, it's a separate talk. I cannot answer in two minutes. But, but by noticing that the current neural networks are being run on digital machines gives you a lot of insights. And that's what we use to prove that you cannot train a feed-forward architecture by Abian Learning. It was going through that route. So, we can talk offline. It's a, it's a longer story, but it's a, it's an important point. All right, let's thank Pierre again. So our final uh, talk of the day. Uh, we're in for a treat. We have a genuine rock star from uh, Black Star. Uh, professor of
Uh, he is a distinguished professor at UC San Francisco. He directs the Institute for Computation and Health Sciences there. He was chief of the Division of Systems Medicine at Stanford. He studied both computer science and went on to get his MD, so he's perfectly qualified to talk to all of us. Uh, his PhD from Harvard MIT, founded two biotech companies, uh, fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics, a uh, member of the National Academy of Medicine. This goes on, I will, I will stop so we can speak, so let's welcome him. You, you don't have to clap. I actually work at University of California, so um, so it's great to be here. I know I'm between. I'm the one hour between you and drinks outside. I've even seen the bottles of wine. Uh, it's been a long day, so we can all enjoy that. Uh, so um, I'll try to stick to time here. First, of course, I'm a medical doctor, so I got to uh, show you my conflicts of interest. I have just a few. Oh Suffice it to say, I've started a couple companies. I consult for a bunch of companies. I wouldn't blame you if you didn't believe another word I said over the next 55 minutes or so. Uh, but I'm most proud of the bottom right. Those are all the companies started by my students. More than half my graduate students now start companies, even if they go into academia. They do this with the most amazing platform in the world. It's usually just simply data. It's often big data. It's often open big data. I'm going to show you how they do it, I'm going to show you how I do it, and maybe I'll convince you this is the most amazing time to be in biomedical innovation and entrepreneurship. So, by the way, a lot of doctors use a slide like this as a slide of shame. This is my slide of significance. In my lab, we do have a saying that if you want to change the world, you can't just keep writing papers about it. You've got to actually invent something and actually get it out there. So if you haven't been convinced already at this point today, we are drowning in data. We're actually drowning in magazines talking about data. Uh, big magazines talk about big data. Uh, every cover you know, of every magazine, The Economist covers it again and again. Uh, this one from The Economist last summer uh, with the picture and with the quotes says that data, big data is the next oil. Uh, I prefer to think of data as the next soil, right? Because oil means you can grab, grab. If I take the barrel, you can't have it. But data means I can take it, you can take it. We could do different things with it here, right? But of course, this cover, The Economist, from five years ago, uh, has this guy collecting ones and zeros with the umbrella. And this was the issue where they announced that the entire human species generates two zettabytes of data every year. If you forget your metric prefixes, it goes kilo, mega, giga, terabyte, petabyte, exabyte, zettabyte. And of course, the following year, it's four zettabytes of data, then eight zettabytes of data, and 16 zettabytes of data, because this doubles every year or two. And I'll be the first to admit, admit most of these zettabytes of data are YouTube videos of kittens playing with pianos and yarn, entertainment data, perhaps, but not scientific data. But there are, of course, scientific data sets in the zettabytes. So for example, the Large Hadron Collider in Europe generated petabytes of data, actually open data for those scientists. But my favorite example is actually NASA. So NASA announced about three years ago that with the James Webb telescope coming online soon, new ground-based telescopes coming online soon, but probably by the, in the next 10 years, NASA will be able to generate an exabyte of data every day, just in terms of pictures, an exabyte of data every day. Now, there's something interesting, though, about NASA's exabytes already. NASA already admits they generate so many pictures of the sky, there are not enough astronomers on this planet to look at all the pictures. Okay? Now, how do you know this? Because they set up a website called Galaxy Zoo. Okay? And you, as a citizen scientist, can go to Galaxy Zoo, you take a test, and then you become the scientist that decides, is that blob in the sky a star or a galaxy? Right? They've crowdsourced it to citizen scientists. But there's an important lesson there. You're going to hear this theme again and again. At a certain point, when you've generated so much scientific data, you run out of conventional scientists. And the only forward motion from that point on is to get a new audience, a new generation, a new community of scientists to help you. And open data is a very powerful enabling mechanism for that to happen. Instead of just keeping these data sets closed, to get more scientists on board means that's usually the only way forward. Now, in fact, so we have so much data now that people are even theorizing that science itself is going to be obsolete. Now, how do you say science is going to be obsolete? That's really ridiculous. Right? Actually, it's a scientific method. Now, this article came out of Wired Magazine, not the most scientific of journals, I admit, in 2008. Very influential for me, actually. Uh, and the idea here is a scientific method, right? So you're, we're all taught the scientific method in third grade, right? You remember, you come up with a question, you call it a hypothesis, then you go gather data to answer the question, right? In third grade, it might be growing pea shoots in the lab or whatever in the, in the classroom. 
But in today's world, we already have the data. 99% of the hard part now is figuring out what's the question to ask. And I'm going to argue to a room full of computer scientists, it's not even coding isn't the hard part, right? Figuring out how to get cloud computing work is not the hard part. Figuring out what you actually want to do is the hard part now, right? What's the killer question to ask that people have been wanting to know the answer to for like 30 years and no one's realized you have the data to answer it now, right? Because you've got to know something about some quantitative skills, let's say coding, and you've got to know what the unmet need is. Right? We need this. We need this one answered. No one's answered this one yet. To have that kind of hybrid is really tough in one person. Even in teams, it's tough. But that's the hardest part. Let's figure out what actually is askable and answerable and interesting with all this data. Now, uh, we're drowning all this data, of course, in biomedicine as well. Now, I'm going to start my talk in the molecular world a little bit, and then I'm obviously going to get to the clinical data side of things. We're drowning in the molecular world, certainly because of devices like this. Now, I could have shown you many different biological devices, like a uh, gene sequencer with bl blinking lights or a mass spectrometer. Uh, I love these gene chips because this is how I got my start back in 1998. These gene chips were so expensive at the time, they were, almost, they were priceless. You put a sample on there, uh, and you got to read out of all the genes in the genome, the RNA for the biology of fishing nose. They were priceless back then, and now they're so cheap. I carry one in every suit, and this is what they actually look like here. I'm holding one up, and I carry props like this because it's important to realize big data comes from little packages like this, uh, and data seems ethereal, but it actually comes down to devices, right? And so we went crazy as a field using these to measure all sorts of different gene expression patterns, and we got tired of measuring them one by one, and we switched to the 96 well plate format. That's so cheap, now I can carry that in my bag. And then we got tired of measuring them 96 at a time, and then we switched to a 384 well plate format, and that's so cheap, now I can carry that in my bag. I cannot more clearly illustrate exponential growth in biomedical data than to show you these plates. And we don't even use this one anymore because we've used, switched to using sequencers to do this, something called RNA-seq. This company, Affymetrix, doesn't even exist anymore. They got acquired by Thermo Fisher or something. And what do we do? We just keep making more and more and more measurements. So what does a well-funded lab do? They go get a big grant to go make a bunch of measurements. They write about a few in a paper. And what do they do next? They go get another grant to go make more measurements. And all these measurements just keep accumulating. And what happened, especially in this field, uh, back in 1999, 2000, 2001, uh, so many people were writing papers with these gene chips that it started with the journals. The journals said, you know, we're getting too many papers with gene chips. No more papers with gene chips. That's it. Okay, enough. Unless you put this data in an international repository where other people can double check all the math and maybe others can use these samples for something else. And so the precedent has always been there in biology. We're still learning this in the clinical world, but in biology, if enough people use a measurement modality, you gotta share the data. It's a, just a matter of time. Uh, it goes back to GenBank now, which is 51 years old, if I do the math correctly. Uh, GenBank, you know, the first paper is coming out with a DNA sequence. Nobody wants to type in AGTCs all over again, right? So they're sending tapes to each other. Any of you remember three inch disks, five inch disks? Eight-inch disks, tapes were before all of that, right? Way before World Wide Web, they were sending data. So the, the precedent's been always there. Get enough scientists to use it, you gotta share the data, right? So in this field, it's open data, this is the revolution. Uh, this paper came out in August of 2012, featured my lab and a whole bunch of others, where we hit this milestone of one million samples publicly available, right? From zero when I started in this field, up to a million. Now, this is 2012, we're at 2019 now, which is about here, and we're about two and a quarter million, which is right about here. So just steady, straight up growth here. That's two million biopsies, two million cell lines, two million operating room samples, two million mouse models, all of that data publicly available. To any of us, even the high school kids that want to do science share projects, this is available to all of us. Now, I'm going to highlight a couple of key data sets that I love, just for the trainees and audience to, to get an idea of what I mean. Here's one example called the Cancer Genome Atlas. If you don't know this data set, it's a killer data set. 14,000 cases of cancer, right? Actual human cancers of 39 different kinds. These are all the different organs and parts of the body involved, like kidney, brain, nervous system. And it's not just RNA measurements, like I'm showing you with these 
exchange trips. It's actually oncogenes, so DNA sequences, some proteomics, methylation data, even the clinical data which drugs were used, even some mammographies for the breast cancer and head imaging, uh, certainly DNA sequencing, all of this data available in the cancer space. Some of this publicly, actually open publicly available, some you have to register to get to because it might be identifiable. So that's one amazing data set. Another one we love is this one called PubChem. Everyone knows PubMed. PubChem is one of the next door neighbors there. It's run by NCBI. This came out of a 15-year-old effort with academics now screening drugs. So the idea here is if you, uh, you know, we can't just depend on pharmaceutical companies to find drugs. Academics should do that too. And the way this works with robots is if you get a cell that's glowing or turns color, if it's living or dying, then you can try to get a robot to test a thousand or a million different drugs to see what works. But if NIH funded you to do that, you got to put that data into PubChem. So the way to think about PubChem is a big grid, a big array. Think of a quarter billion drugs. Those are the columns. 1.3 million drug screens. Those are the rows. So if you do that math, that is 300 trillion little boxes in this grid of which a billion of them have been tested already. So this drug and this screen, this drug and that screen. Now, of the quarter billion substances, 71 million meet what's called Lipinski's rule of thumb. That means you could make it into an oral drug. You could take a pill if you wanted it to be. And of the billion measurements, 1.2 million were active. That means the researcher said, I didn't just make the measurement. I think it's working in this screen. Now, I can easily bet you a beer this beats any pharmaceutical company's drug screen. Ah, I can, beat you a I can bet you a bottle of wine. This beats all pharmaceutical companies combined because this is still doubling every two to three years, and nothing in pharma discovery now is doubling every two to three years. In fact, those folks are kind of laying off people right now, right? And they give this data out without a user ID and password, right? Who knows what drugs are in the columns of this grid that are just waiting for you to invent, right? Someone's made a measurement and just is sitting there waiting for you. It's just examples of the data sets and thousands of others out there. Now, what are we trying to do with all this is try to get to a better way to practice medicine. We call this precision medicine, right? We love this phrase in California, certainly in the University of California. Uh, what is precision medicine? A lot of different definitions. To me, precision medicine is going to be the customization of medical care I'm going to deliver to a patient, okay? Customization. And it's customized based on measurements I'm going to get from that individual. Right? Of course, I'm going to have biological measures like DNA, proteins, right? RNA, things like that. But I might also need behavioral measurements. I might need your exercise. I actually need to know your preferences. I can tolerate this kind of side effect. I really don't want that kind of side effect. But all of these are going to be measurements. They're not just biology. I might need some from your devices or from your smartphones. I might have to ask you some questions. I need a lot of measurements from you. But actually, I can't just do it with measurements from you. I need those kind of measurements on a lot of people. And even more confusing, I need to remember what medical care did I give to all these people and what's working or what's not working, right? And then apply it all to you. So I can't just do it personalized. To get this, all, this whole database, I need a precision uh, type of data to do this. Now, if you look at the seminal report on precision medicine, going back to the National Academies back in 2011, it's a nice tome to read. It's only about 70 or so pages. This is the killer figure. It's going to seem obvious to you now. But to me, these three ovals are the hard part in precision medicine. We need better diagnostics. We need better treatments. We need to figure out our health outcomes. So I'm going to do for the rest of the talk now is just give you examples and anecdotes of how exactly we can use all this data out there to get the better diagnostics, better treatments, better outcomes, OK? So let's start with diagnostics. What is a diagnostic? A diagnostic helps, helps a health professional, like a doctor or nurse, figure out if you have a disease or not, right? You heard about sepsis earlier today, uh, a lot of different disorders, uh, mental health disorders. A diagnostic, might, I might have an imaging diagnostic or blood test. In fact, I love protein, blood, uh, protein diagnostics. I love tests where, uh, so I remember when I was a pediatrician a long time ago, why do I love proteins? It turns out, you know, if you have a screaming toddler with a sore throat and a fever. Maybe you've had this done to yourself, or maybe you've had this done to your child. Did you know you can stick this Q-tip back there in the throat, put some drops? You can tell if they have strep throat or not, right? Have you ever seen that done? I'm sure you've had that done. Uh, that's called a rapid strep test. Uh, now, in scientific lingo, that's an enzyme-linked imbuosorbent acid. It's an ELISA. It's 1970s technology. But I love those kind of diagnostics because you don't even need a refrigerator for those kinds of kits, right? You just got to know what protein to make these things against. So so we start just to look and see what kind of data do we have. 
And my first big NIH grant was, you know, we have all this, these RNA measurements and RNA codes for protein. Why don't we just start gathering every d disease that's ever been studied by anyone, right? This cancer and that cancer and diabetes, we started to collect experiments from the public data, disease and healthy. Each box is a gene. Maybe we got more of this one, less of this one. And people have been calculating these signatures for decades. Marina started this work. Now she's her own faculty member running her own lab. But remember, for any one disease, I don't just have to pick one data set. I have hundreds or thousands of people studying these disorders now, right? We've had these technologies for 20 years. I don't just have to depend on one person's data set. I have hundreds of people. I can figure out what's in common there. And just to make the biology obvious here, you know, it's dangerous to show the central dogma right before the wine is served. Uh, but DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. We have a whole bunch of these measurements. I'm trying to get to these, but these are harder to make tests on. Uh, but there's an arrow here. So if the RNA is changing, maybe the protein is changing. And we're going to chase some of those down. So the idea here, I'll skip through some of these. We did a whole bunch of different disorders. But the one I want to spend a moment talking about is this one, preeclampsia. Show of hands if you've heard of this disease. Yeah, so this is a little bit more of a computational audience here. Yeah, it's usually about a third to a half of the audience. And it's usually the half of the audience that actually watched Downton Abbey because one of the characters dies of this condition. Spoiler alert uh, if you haven't seen the series here. But preeclampsia is when you're pregnant. This is Sybil, right? She dies of this. Uh, spoiler alert. So uh, when you're pregnant, uh, a woman's pregnant, sometimes uh, something goes wrong. We still know exactly what. But the blood pressure goes shooting high. The mom can die. The baby can die. Still a problem across the world, every country, every ethnicity. And the only treatment is really to take the baby out, but then we pediatricians have to keep these tiny babies alive for weeks or months, disease-free. Very tough problem to do. Uh, and the blood test for this, actually we don't have a blood test. The diagnostic for this is one of the most nonspecific tests we have. We look for urine protein, okay? Not even a specific one, right? Maybe the most nonspecific test we have in today's obese America where a lot of people are going to now have protein in their urine from diabetes and other things. So we wanted to come up with a blood test for this. So what do you do? Well, instead of going to the medical center and getting an IRB and approval, you just type in preeclampsia, right? So type in preterm birth, preeclampsia, premature birth. 266 people have already studied this. Here are 299 samples, 249 samples, 154 samples. Here's preeclampsia. These are all the human samples. And what we do is we just pick and choose or gather them all. And the basic methodology is like a Venn diagram here, right? What's in common? What are all of these researchers seeing? You know, I love the fact that all of these folks are following the rules and sharing their data. I don't trust a single one of them. Right? But I trust what they see in common. It's called wisdom of the crowd, right? If all of them or a whole bunch of them are seeing the same marker, I'm going to go chase that down. And so we did that, uh, chased down a whole bunch. Uh, here's one, uh, we chased it down to the protein form, and here's one called hemopexin. And here it's elevated in preeclampsia compared to normal, healthy pregnant women as a control. And no matter what the gestational age, early or late pregnancy, but March of Dimes funding to do this. We had one of these seed grants. This is when I was back at Stanford, a seed grant, uh, one of these uh, CTSA seed grants to get the samples tested. We wrote all the papers that you can follow with the link here. And what do you do next in Silicon Valley? You start a company on this. And I'm not, it's not taboo to talk about companies, okay? So let me be really crystal clear to this academic audience here, okay? We raised $2 million in seed financing. Let me be really crystal clear. First, $2 million is not a lot of money to raise in Silicon Valley if you read any headlines, okay? But the idea here is the startup company is now how the science continues out of academia. The next experiment we need to run after all of this compute is a prospective multicenter trial. Does it actually work in women going forward, right? That science experiment will be done in the startup company funded by private dollars. Or to put it another way, do you know how hard it is to get a brand new $2 million NIH grant today, right? The question is now more relevant because it might actually lead to a product. That science is continued by a startup company funded by private dollars here. That's the concept here. It may still fail, but that they're the ones who are going to run the experiment. So I love this story. I start with this story usually, because as you can see on the bottom right here, this company's already been acquired. Now some of you know what that means. So we started with public data, which people think is as valueless as kitten videos. We design a diagnostic, we test these samples off the freezers and off the internet. We launched the company, sold the company, start to finish, 24 months. Inventors happy. Investors happy. 
Of course, we're going to do more of these, and I'm giving away the secrets here, because every one of you could take a different disease, make a diagnostic, and we'd never step on each other's toes. That's how many diagnostics we need in medicine today. Uh, who's going to make the one for this sub, sub, sub type of cancer, right? We need so many. Each one of you could pick a different one from the book, and we'd never compete with each other. Everything I just told you is all described in all the reports and all the links. And all these slides are on slideshare.net already, so you don't have to take pictures even. All right? Everything's already described in open access papers. You just repeat as many times as you wish. All right, the drug side is even worse. Okay, the drug story is even worse. How much does it cost to make a new drug? You know, we're kind of really, really close to drug companies here, and I love them, Allergan and all the rest. They're not on this list, uh, luckily. But uh, how much does it cost to make a new drug? Well, everyone says it takes ten years and a billion dollars, right? Have you heard that? It takes ten years and it takes a billion dollars to make a new drug. Actually, a billion dollars is an underestimate. Okay, so how do you get the right answer? It's really simple math, even for this audience right before drinks. Okay, here's the, here's the formula. How much did you spend? Divide by how many drugs did you get? Okay, very simple math. How much did you spend? Divide by how many drugs you get? If you do that math, you realize it costs these top 12 companies $4 billion and $12 billion per drug. Probably not sustainable. But that is a very negative way to pick on the farm industry. Let me paint this picture amazingly in a positive way, okay? Even if every pharma and biotech company on the planet was 100% successful in developing every drug they're working on, there are not enough companies on the planet to develop all the drugs we need for precision medicine. Tell me which company's going to work on sub, sub, sub type of lung cancer, right? With only 10 patients, right? There are not enough companies on the planet to work on drug discovery. It's the NASA astronomer problem all over again. And that means the problem comes down to each one of us in academia. If we don't do this, nobody's going to do it, okay? Look, I love all these companies. I can solve for them all. You saw my second slide. I have no faith they're going to solve this problem. That's like asking, why didn't IBM invent an iPhone? Culture is not right, okay? Culture is right in academia. We got to do it. It's, our, it's going to be our responsibility to figure this out. Now, I'm not saying I have the world's solution to drug discovery, but hell, can't we use all this data out there to figure out something? So I already told you we can get all the data on diseases and healthy, right, from public data. And then I showed you PubChem, and it's one of many data sets of just drugs, right? There's a connectivity map, which is now called Lynx, where people are just putting out cell data with and without drugs. So on the left, you got with and without disease, and on the right, you got with and without drugs. And we're going to put these two together, right? Very simple algorithms. The reporters call this match com for drugs. Some of you know Match.com, right? It helps you find a date, maybe a mate or a spouse. And so it's the same methodology, right? We're kind of a matching algorithm. Or, you know, you know what the famous saying when you're trying to find a husband or a spouse or a wife? Have you heard opposites attract, right? You've heard of that? Same informatics methodology. I'm going to show you all the bioinformatics with my arms. If I got a disease where this gene goes up and this gene goes down, and I can find a drug that knows how to make this one go down and this one go up, maybe there's a match there, right? I'm naively looking for drugs that reverse the pattern in the disease. It's naive. I admit it's naive, right? So you can ma imagine Pearson correlation coefficients and Kolmogorov Smirnoff test, two genes, imagine 20,000 genes. That's a basic idea. A lot of ways to do this. So we turn our crank, and we got lots of ideas. Ideas. This could be a drug, and that could be a drug. But where we had a lot of traction aren't the new drugs, it's the new uses of the old drugs, right? This concept called drug repositioning. Now, of course, we didn't invent this concept. It goes back 50 years, actually goes back to World War II, but though actually the two examples most people know, the one is the interesting cardiac drug that had a side effect of hair growth, which is now minoxidil, but of course, everyone knows the other cardiac drug that had its own interesting side effect, of course, of course which is known as Viagra, and Viagra has had a double repositions, also known as Revatio, used to, for the very obscure indication of babies that have problems uh, with the blood vessels from the heart to the lungs. It turns out it can blow those vessels up and get more blood that way, too. People were teasing babies on Viagra when that came out. Now, the whole point, though, is instead of finding these by accident, how about we find them on purpose using all this data that's out there and all of these chips? So we turn our crank. We got a lot of these published, I think up to 15 or so now. I'll just show you some of my favorite ones. 
This one came out in 2013. This was a prediction uh, that this psychiatric drug is an antidepressant, so we use it for depression, called imipramine, works on small cell lung cancer. So humans smoke to get small cell lung cancer. If you knock out these three genes in a mouse, this mouse gets mouse lung cancer, okay? So it's not a nude mouse with a xenograft model. It's actually it's a mouse getting its own lung cancer. Here you can see the nodules. And this mouse is treated with imipramine. So what's imipramine? It's a tricyclic antidepressant. It's still in the pharmacy, but we really don't need to use it. We got much better antidepressants like serotonin reuptic inhibitors, Prozac, and the others. Imipramine has some side effects. It can make you sleepy. And in some people, very few people, it might set you up for what's called QT prolongation. It might set you up for an arrhythmia. Actually, neither of those two side effects sound as bad as having lung cancer, a 5% survival rate in five years, and it's melted away in this mouse. It's just gone, okay? So why do I love this story? Because we made the computational prediction. We test cell lines in a dish. I'm not even going to show you that. We get this amazing mouse picture. 15 months after the computational prediction, we got IRB approval. We launched a clinical trial on this one. Total cost of this phase two AAAA study, phase two A study, total cost 50,000 bucks. Okay, not even a million, not even a hundred grand. This fits in conveniently in a CTSA pilot award, right? That's the whole point of doing these. Now I'm financially connected to this molecule. I'm not part of the trial. I don't care if this works or fails. We got to do a thousand of these in academia. Show me the drug company that was working on small cell lung cancer. I'm still struggling to find one pharma company working on this. If we don't do this in academia, nobody's going to do this. The responsibility comes down to us, each one of us, especially the compute folks in this audience. And what I'm also trying to tell you is I didn't even show you a single p-value here, right? The finish line is beyond the predictions now. The finish line is beyond the p-values. If you don't figure out how to do a mouse model, no one's going to take that finding for it. you got to figure out how to work with those folks and get to that kind of test now. That is the new useful validation. Not just can I get this leave one out cross validation. I love those two, but it's our responsibility to go further now. If you don't launch the trial, nobody's going to do it. Let's show you one that hasn't been published yet. This was kind of interesting to your neighbors at Allergan here. Uh, this is a disease called psoriasis. Uh, psoriasis, have you heard of it? It's like an autoimmune condition. So the body's kind of attacking the skin, and it's kind of got red, flaky kind of skin. It gets thicker. Uh, now, this mouse has psoriasis, okay? Martin, Miles and Peter Martin did this. I'm neither a mouse person nor a psoriasis person, I admit. But, you know, the hair looks kind of weird here. I can't really see the fingers or the digits. All better down here, okay? Here, this mouse really looks cuter to me. I can see the fingers, okay? This is pre and post. This drug is a 1960s diuretic. In other words, in the 1960s, we used this drug to make you pee. We have much better ways to make you pee now. We don't use this drug anymore, okay? But do we have a New England Journal of Medicine papers written about this one back then, okay? And whether you give it topically or systemically, you know, like a cream or internally, this mouse gets better. It's a mouse, genetic engineer mouse model for psoriasis. Now, you could argue back to me, if you especially know somebody about medicine, why the hell are you working on psoriasis? There are plenty of biotech companies out there that love to sell me an anti-IL-1223 monoclonal antibody at 25 to $50,000 a year, right? You wipe out big components of the immune system, of course, an autoimmune disease gets better. Why on earth are you working on psoriasis? Let me show you what these cells look like. It's kind of cool. So this is what normal mouse skin looks like. And the pink up here are called keratinocytes. And in psoriasis, they go crazy. Instead of staying at the top, they go deep. They plentiful, they, there's plentiful numbers, and then they, they don't stay at the top, they go deep. You can see them kind of growing along this hair follicle or something here. This is half the dose, it's a double the dose, and you can see all the keratinocytes are back to where they're supposed to be. That's kind of interesting. But the most important part here are the blue. Those are all the immune cells. This is the first small molecule that fixes the keratinocytes in psoriasis and is not an immunosuppressant. Nobody has a molecule like this in the world. And it was sitting there in public data a 1960s diuretic. Can I more convince you the value of open big data? Who knows how many other columns are just sitting there? An important drug waiting for you. Because if you don't look, nobody's going to find it at this point. We're buried in data right now. Who knows how many other molecules are sitting there? Right? Now, why do I need a $50,000 a year 
well, you know the questions we're asking here. And what do you do in Silicon Valley? You start a company on this. And this became Numedi. They're working. So I call you. So there's only seven full-time people in Numedi. So we, got a, uh, we have a biotech company with only seven people. So a phrase I use for this are garage biotechs. Right? Look, we, we worship garages in Silicon Valley for some reason. Right? Apple starts in a garage. It's a landmark. HP starts in a garage. It's like a national landmark. Right? Uh, or you start companies in dorm rooms. Right? So wh how, what do you actually need to get started with a biotech company in your garage? Right? You've got two million microarrays. Right? You can get these mouse models done off the internet. There's another whole story around that. What else do you need to get started with a biotech to make drugs in your garage? And I don't mean making meth in your garage. No, uh, I mean making cancer drugs, diabetes drugs, not, not meth, OK? But that's what a potent, powerful team can do, empowered by all this data. All right, so let's get to some more interesting, more recent stuff. By the way, what's the next big open data? What's half my lab working on? What's the hockey puck we're skating to? Clinical trials data. What's a clinical trial? the most extensive experiment in the world. And half of these fail. That's why it's costing us billions to do these. And when they fail, we don't even write a paper about it. Never mind, release the raw data. Oh, man, that's going to change. EMA, which is the European FDA, is requiring raw clinical trials data release. And I don't mean that summary table in clinicaltrials.gov. I mean every drug, every dose, every arm, right? De-identified, of course. FDA is probably going to get there to head that off. A lot of pharma companies releasing raw clinical trials data in various forms. I run this thing called IMPORT, National Allergy and Infectious Disease, uh, 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 National Allergy, uh, Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, NIAID. If NIAID touched the clinical trial, that raw data is now on uh, IMPORT. You can go log in, download it, play with it. I think there's going to be a lot we're going to do with clinical trials data. I'll give you one example. We have so many clinical trials, actually, already in IMPORT. You know how clinical trials run? You know, there's usually one group that gets the drug and the other group gets a placebo or a control, right? We saw so many people in all these control groups, we gathered them all up and realized we have more than 10,000 patients or people who are in the control groups not tested with the drug. We gathered all that up, realized we had a whole bunch of immune measurements on them, and now we call that the 10,000 Immunomes Project. And it's all given away at uh, 10kminimums.org. There's an R shiny way to download all of this. But 242 manually curated experiments where you get, just got all the control groups across age, race, uh, uh, gender, um, uh, different uh, uh, ethnicities. We've got microarrays. We've got uh, Luminex. We've got all of these. We give all this data out to the public. So this is one example. Just getting the controls from all of these studies is an amazing repository for data. All right, so let's go further, and let me talk about what I've been doing since I've been at University of California. I've been at UCSF, uh, luckily now running this new uh, Baker Computational Health Sciences Institute. We got this great naming gift last summer. I'm really proud of that. Uh, if you haven't been to San Francisco recently, especially UCSF, we're growing like crazy. I mean, the buildings are just ridiculous. We're slumming it out in this brand new building until our brand new building opens uh, later this year. I think we're moving in on the second floor in December. And just to orient you, this all south of the ballpark, if you know where, uh, what used to be called Pac-Bell, it used to be SBC, now Pac-Bell, now it's Oracle uh, uh, Arena, it's the baseball stadium. Uh, and uh, so that's us, that's where we're going to be there. And this is the Warrior Stadium complex. I'm sure you've heard of the Warriors at this point. So we're going to be right next door. I don't know what that means for traffic, but I'm guessing it's better for restaurants because it's like a restaurant desert right here. It's like no, no decent place to eat. Uh, and we got our start, though, with a gift from Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg, $10 million. So I'm going to show you what we've been spending that first batch of money on, actually. What have we been doing to get all this data organized? So it's great. I love running this institute, right? We've got 50 faculty. You can see all their credentials. I won't stay on that. But we're not an academic home for these types of folks, right? They could have been scattered in different departments. We even have folks in a nursing school, dental school, where the academic home got new educational plans going, especially just trying to roll out basic coding to every single student at UCSF. My goal, we're working with our library system. So these aren't four credit courses, just very basic two-week cor two courses in R and Python. We've paid for enough seats to make sure every single student at UCSF now learns how to write code. I don't care if you're a cancer biologist or immune, uh, immune scientist. We, if you, you're probably going to need to know at least something about R and Python at this point. For no matter what kind of medical student, you should at least learn. So we've, we're just going broad with some basic, basic coding here. Organize all our infrastructure and operations and build all these new data assets. And that's what I'm going to end with is what I think is the most amazing new data asset, which you've been hearing about all day, uh, and that is, to me, electronic health record data. 
Electronic health records are so old, they're new again. Okay, it's astounding, and we're still buying the same old products. And boy, are they expensive. I don't think anyone's mentioned the cost of these yet. Here are three of our frenemies here uh, on the list here. You can see how much they spent on electronic health records. So Sutter, right, is in California, mostly in Northern California, spent $1 billion on electronic health record systems. Partners, which is Mass General Hospital and Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, started at $1.2 billion for their system. And Kaiser spent $4 billion on their electronic health record system. Now, amazingly, they all bought the same software, Epic, okay? The price tag ranges from one billion to four billion dollars for this software package, okay? Plus all the ecosystem around it. It's astounding. And so the narrative I want to get you to think about is the country is spending hundreds of billions of dollars putting these systems in and rounding error close to zero using any of this data today. Okay? Not even close to an order of magnitude in using the data compared to just collecting this data. You know, if you know what these systems are, if you've seen any doctor recently, you've seen the back of their head, they're typing this in. I call this the most expensive data in America. We're paying doctors to type this stuff in now, right? It's also funny, Sutter spends a billion dollars, it's written up as a boondoggle. Kaiser spends four times that amount. It's like they placed a bet and they won. This teaches me it helps to have your friends as the reporters writing the stories here, right? <laughs> Amazing. So with that, let's think about electronic health records. And with that, let me reintroduce the University of California to you. Right? Of course, you're on UC Irvine's campus here, and most of you are from UC Irvine. But let me just reintroduce how impressive UC is. Of course, we have 10 campuses and three national labs. We have three supercomputer centers, right? New Orleans, Berkeley, Lawrence Livermore, and San Diego supercomputer centers. We have 200,000 employees. We're actually one of the larger employers in the United States quarter million students per year. And if you just take the health enterprise, we have 18 health professional schools, six of which are medical schools, where we have nursing schools, pharmacy schools, dental schools, veterinary schools, that totals 18. We train half the medical students in resident California, so that, in other words, that means if we teach them to do something right, it can scale pretty quickly because they graduate. We get a tenth of all uh, NIH funding comes to UC. Uh, this is a little bit older, we passed $12 billion in clinical revenue, just the dollars we get seeing patients. We have 5,000 physicians that get a paycheck from us, but 100,000 doctors write orders on our patients. They might be community docs writing prescriptions or any of that. Uh, you can see all the nurses, and we're not just random hospital systems. UCSF, UCLA are in the top 10. The other three are aspirationally going to get there, and we all five uh, have uh, NCI Comprehensive Cancer Centers. All five have what are called Clinical and Translational Science Awards. So all of them are the best of the best here, okay? And now what we're talking about is an enterprise that might be an umbrella across the health systems here. That's the idea. The idea is called UC Health. Now, UC Health, right, this idea is to actually build a single accountable care organization across the entire health enterprise. So an accountable care organization means a group that can start to take on the risk of taking care of a patient. In other words, an accountable care organization means you're paid a certain amount of money per member per month, and no matter what good or bad happens to that patient, you're not getting any more money out of this, okay? So it means you've got to know a lot of math, a lot of predictions, and a lot of kind of analytics to figure out where could this patient go and how much is it actually costing us to do the business here? So the idea here is that the entire University of California will make a single accountable care organization someday, aspirationally, 10 years from now, okay? Don't go looking for a website to go sign up right now, okay, or even in the fall. Someday, we're going to, and we're partnering with United Health Group to learn how to take on risk. You may love them or hate them. I'm not going to pass judgment on them, okay? There's a love-hate thing with everyone in the ecosystem here. But that's the aspiration. But you know what happens here is that the minute you've decided to do this, you got to put the data in one place. Right, what happens, the next thing that happens, well, at UCSF, we take care of transplant patients this way. UCLA, they do it that way. That's kind of weird. Or UC San Diego will say, well, we take care of cancer patients this way. UC Irvine will say, that's kind of weird. Right, you gotta figure out the right one way to do this, or maybe two or three ways to do this, but you gotta figure out how are we taking care of patients? Where is the care practice variation? And all of a sudden, you gotta have, an, you have a need to put the state in one place. Now, there's a national narrative out there that it is so hard to get electronic health record systems to talk to each other. Have you seen this narrative? A lot of people say it's so hard to get these systems to talk to each other. It's so much easier to get them to talk to each other when there's a business reason to do it, 
Okay? And the minute there's a business reason, it's auto-magical how fast this actually comes together because people need the answers right away. So what we're talking about is the six different health systems all pointing to one. I would not be a proper IT guy if I didn't know how to make boxes point to boxes. So here's the one slide where that happens, okay? UCSF, UCLA are the big gorillas here. UC Irvine, UC San Diego, UC Davis are here. And Riverside is tiny, okay? Brand new medical school. They don't even have hospitals there. They have some clinics. They have a couple thousand patients. But we're going to show them just like everyone else here. And all six go to one here. Now, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of stories how this is already helping us and how this is going to help all of you in a moment here. But the first important point, and this was brought up by quite, uh, some questions earlier uh, uh, before the lunch, uh, is we are also making sure patients benefit from this. And what that means is, you know, and most people don't even know this, on an iPhone today, this little app here, the health app, maybe some of you have tried this before, maybe you've opened uh, this app. You know, maybe last year, it might have had your step count and maybe your sleep data if you were ex exporting stuff into that. Not the most useful data, except for some of the audience here. But now, if you open up this app, type on health data, go to health records, it does a geolocation, or you can just type in. Literally, you can get download your data from your hospital system, especially if it's the University of California. We export all that data in a federal standard called FHIR. Okay, so it's not just a FHIR feed of the data. It's actually onto the Apple Health app, which is a, another bar up there. There's a link here that tells you, uh, there's a whole blog post on exactly how to do this, but any patient that gets care at any one UC or across the UCs now gets a single timeline feed of all their lab data. Basically, everything you'd see on the portal that Epic gives you, but actually it's all in the Apple Health app. Now, why that's cool to a room full of programmers here is, by the way, Apple's iOS now has two commands that any developer can use to just access that data for your own predictive apps for any of that. You got to tap, as a user, you got to tap yes, I give permission for that app to use it. But they're like a lot of zero apps right now that do this, and I'm predicting like a thousand of them, which we should be writing here. Okay, what does that mean? You can write an app that works on health record data. You don't need to know who Epic or Cerner are. You don't even need to know who UCSF and UC Irvine are. Right? All that data is provided to you as a component of the iOS SDK right now. If you don't know what that means, just type in health, API, SDK, iOS. You'll see the two commands. There's only two commands you need to read in all the medical record data. Go crazy and write these apps right now, okay? All right, so that's a patient side. Everything else I'm going to tell you about is for us. Where are we now? This is as of a couple of days ago. We got UCSF, UCLA, Irvine, Davis, San Diego, and Riverside. The number we love to start with is 15 million patients. Right? We have some medical record data on 15 million patients. We love that number because it's 5% of the U.S. population. The University of California has treated 5% of the U.S. population in the last 15 years. So it's 15 million patients in the last 15 years. It's an impressive number. Now, I'll be the first to admit, most of these folks got a flu shot from us and never saw us again. But we treated them. I'll go give them something. Now, if you start from the, so that's basic data. If you start from the modern era, okay? And by modern era, I mean when UCLA and UCSF were the first to put in EPIC. And by the way, I hate using the word modern and epic in the same sentence here, okay? But you know what I mean. 2012 forward, we've seen now 5.3 million patients with modern data. That means all the care data that's in epic now we put into one place. 125 million encounters. Let me tell you what an encounter means to epic. Did you know every time a patient calls us, we document the phone calls in epic? Can you imagine the AI learning on every single phone call made to every one of our nurses and doctors? Just imagine just that one piece of data, what you could learn from just the phone calls we're trying to deal with, right? That's all in encounters. Nearly half a billion procedures, my favorite, 620 million medications that we've ordered, 627 million diagnosis codes, and 1.3 billion blood test results and vital signs. We also have state regulatory data. We're getting more text elements. I'll talk about text in a moment. Pathology and radiology especially. And it turns out the University of California also runs what's called the death index. Uh, in, you know, in the United States, we've got to reuse social security numbers. right? We, don't have, we have too many people. Uh, so you've got to keep track of who dies so you can reuse the numbers. Usually one group in every state gets that contract. Amazingly, the University of California runs that contract. It's UC Davis. So all of that data. So if anyone dies in California, we know that's integrated in here as well. Claims data, I'll talk about it in a moment. I've got all these dashboards here. Now, the most important thing here for this audience, I think, is OMOP. We're not using Epic to do this. We're done paying Epic for this, okay? We're using OMOP, which is the Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership. OMOP is also so old, it's new again. 
Okay, so like 10 years old, Columbia University and FDA Sentinel projects. It's a vendor neutral way to just save patient data. Why it's so important, it's open access. It's a lot of open source code. We give some out, we get some back in. And all of the data sources transform into OMOP, and then we can just uh, have a common layer, regardless of the source. This is why this was working. Even before UC Irvine just put, on, just put in Epic, you were using all scripts. We were working with all scripts too. It doesn't matter who the vendor was. It's a vendor neutral way to do this here. I know this is a tech audience, so I'll spend one more time talking, one more slide on the tech. We got OMOP in the middle here, Calibra. Never even heard of this company. I bet you haven't either. But if you're looking for some source uh, to manage all the ontologies and vocabularies, and I like this ontology, but I got to change a couple things, you can check them in, check them out. It's an amazing tool. Tableau is like Excel on steroids for graphics. Uh, SQL Server, I wish it were my SQL or something open access, but everyone loves SQL Server. Azure, uh, UCLA just made an announcement today, putting health data in Azure. Now they're the blessed, blessed cloud provider for now. And of course, we have R, Jupyter, Julia, and of course, SAS and all the rest kind of commercial tools on there as well. Let's spend a moment talking about notes. We're pretty far along on notes now, I think. So there's two concepts with notes. Right? So most of the medical care is delivered in notes, okay, or at least documented in notes. So you got all these notes. Patient came in, patient was discharged, patient was seen in clinic. You got the phone call notes. And so there's two things we're trying to do with notes. One is, can we extract concepts from the notes? Okay, it's a well-known problem. You don't even need to put strictly natural language processing. You can use concept identifiers to do it. Regular expressions get a lot of important numbers out of it. That's one direction. And the other is to de-identify the notes. Okay, de-identify means I can sleep at night and no one's gonna figure out who these patients are from the notes. Now let me be really simple and stupid for a moment. You want the fastest way to de-identify a note? Get rid of every word in the note. Obviously it's de-identified, obviously, right? But there's nothing useful left. So the trick with de-identification is remove only the words you have to remove and keep as many as you can through the filter. So we got IRB approval. We've been working on this for now two and a half years. We manually de-identify 25,000 notes, okay? So we've been paying pizza money to residents and fellows just to de-identify. These are our care providers. Of course, we tr trust them with the notes. And then we've been using that to train our systems. So we, I think we got the best uh, de-identification tool. And now it's right now, it's in a, at a company called Cal Forensics. And believe it or not, the entire University of California has chosen one company to bless all of these tools called Cal Forensics. Once it passes Cal Forensics, we can use this across the entire University of California. So we start with UCSF, I can easily get to those notes, and then we're gonna scale across the whole UC. And that's where we're getting the blessing from. So concept, so de-identification, uh, we have a, can you believe it, at UCSF, we have one Linux director with 70 million notes in it. You can even grep in there if you know what I mean. But that's where we're putting a tool called filter that we've written, we think we're gonna get that certified. That's de-identification. Information extraction, a little bit more naive. I know Amazon's got a product, Google's got their thing going. We're just using CTAKES, we're looking for something better. Regular expressions work for a lot of things, but we, I think we gotta get better at extracting all the meat out of these notes as well. All right, so where are we? Here's where we are. Well, this is a geolocation of every patient, University of California, at least seen recently, UCSF, UC Davis, UCLA, UC Irvine, UC San Diego, and the Riverside is just one red blip somewhere over there. Um, and by the way, like this is Las Vegas. Of course we see patients in Las Vegas. We see patients from all over the world. If you're sick in this part of the world, you come to UC for care, okay? The Hawaiian Islands are covered with our colors, okay? If you're really sick there, you come to UC. Age, race, ethnicity, gender, of course, we can do all that. Now, some of you who've been working on the medical side for a while are used to working with claims data. Okay, so claims data we've had for 20 or 30 years. I see a couple nods here. Remember claims data? Those are the bills we send back and forth. Bills are great. But this next slide proves to you why this is better than claims data. The claims data, you know we've paid for something, you have no idea what the result was, right? That's the biggest problem with claims data. Here I have 2.2 million LDL measurements. This happens to be a component of your lipid panel, okay? Here just 2.2 million I just dumped out. With, this is literally plotted in R, right? Uh, now, I'm a pediatrician technically. I never really ordered this test much on kids, but I'm told it's great to have this number under 200. So lucky for us, we have a million of them under 200. Sadly, we have a million over 200. We should make sure these folks are on the right therapy, like statins, and now we can tell if they're on the right therapy because we got all the drug data for these folks too. Right? That's the idea of delivering quality of care. And the leader of delivering all this quality of care has been UC Irvine. Okay? You see, there are more technical people on this project at Irvine than anywhere else in the UC system. They're all actually over in orange uh, right now in the building. 
Here's an example where UCI Irvine was a year ago, uh, and we've just, we've just been blindly copying this across the UC system. This is an example of a dashboard that we do. So uh, let me give you a little bit of context. So California is what's called a Medicaid waiver state. So for poor people, you get care uh, paid for by Medicaid. It all goes to Sacramento. Sacramento gives it out to us. But we got to report quality measures constantly. We're doing the right thing. We're doing the right thing. And the old set of measures is called Prime. Okay, So this is as of last year. And so the way this works is here's colorectal cancer screening. The state wants us to be at 57.62%. We're at 57.95%. So that's a blue bar. Blue is a good bar. We just got a third of a million dollars. Okay, so here is, uh, let's see, hemoglobin A1C. Okay, I'm a diabetes guy, this pains me. But we're supposed to treat our patients bad or really well, and the state wants us to be, at this point, 31.47%. So we gotta get people under the bad amount. We're only at 32.26%, so we have an orange bar. So we gotta work on that one until the end of the year. And each orange bar is a third of a million dollars. Now to put that in context for this research audience, imagine each one of these is an R01. R01, 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 R01. R01 all the way down, okay? Yeah, so now we gotta fix these because we can see these problems and we can actually address them. Not a lot of people can do dashboards. But if you click on any one of these bars, you'll literally see who is coming in tomorrow for care, okay? Here's the mammography clinic. This uh, is all blurred out, you can't see a damn thing here, right? They're coming in at 9 o'clock, 9 15, 9 uh, 30, 9 45. This patient's coming in at 9 15, they're missing four of these measures. Somebody go to the mammography unit and figure out why they're missing four quality measures. Fix the problem, document an epic, and one by one by one by one, you fix the quality problem for patients, right? That's how you do it. So a lot of people can do dashboards because we have every, all the scheduling in one place, we can do this UC-wide now. This is a patient we need to work on tomorrow at nine o'clock. Now UC Irvine had this up and running. UC Davis wanted to copy this. And it took one FTE, one person, 48 hours to get this up and running at UC Davis because we've all agreed to use OMOP for this, right? Have you ever heard of a health IT project taking only 48 hours, okay? <laughs> Literally the same thing because we actually all use the same data model. We're all on OMOP now, open data model here. Let me give you some more kind of interesting directions and then we'll call it quits and have a drinks. Another killer advantage to UC, remember I said we had 200,000 employees? It's kind of amazing. And you know, you know, most companies, including University of California, technically we're a company, most companies in the fall, they ask you to choose a health provider, right? Open enrollment, you can get to choose who your doctors are. I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands. Many of our employees choose Kaiser, our friend of me. Uh, but a third of our employees choose us for medical care. So they work for us, but they get their health through us. Now think through the arrows there for a second. You know, big companies like Walmart can't treat their own employees. I know what they're trying to do. Apple can't treat their own employees. I know what they're trying to do, okay? But we, because we deliver healthcare, we can actually deliver healthcare to our own employees, right? So now if you think through that set, we are maximally incented to make sure the right care goes to our own employees. They work for us, they are us, right? So let me really work, walk through the arrows here for a second. If we had one of our doctors providing really rotten care to one of our employees and generates a really high bill, we probably pay that bill to ourselves. That's the equivalent of burning money on the front lawn, okay, of the hospital. So we're all incentivized to make sure the right cost effective, the right care goes to our employees in a way that nothing else matters here, right? And now we make sure we're looking at these numbers. It turns out our own healthcare costs have been skyrocketing just like the rest of America, but they're our doctors. But what's wrong with this picture here? One thing we realized, again, AI comes down to the problem you apply to, okay? That's gonna be the, the moral here. It came down to this kind of really silly concept. We've had our own doctors writing prescriptions to our own employees for brand name metformin, okay? Metformin is a generic drug. It's used around the world. It's one of the safest drugs for type two diabetes. It's been available in generics, but, we've, but our docs are writing prescriptions for the brand name because those were the advertisements and all of this. And now we have the master list of every doc who keeps doing this and every patient that keeps getting this. 
And so, for example, what this means is Glumetza, 500 milligram tablets. Glumetza is a brand name. $3,200, one patient got this, one doctor doing this, three times because it got, got renewed. Substituted for this one, we'd say $4,480. 4,000, 9,000, 1,000, 7,000, 3,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. And now we can just call all these docs. And look, I admit, if you're a patient taking a pill, you don't want to change the color of the pill. You're used to the color of the pill. I get it. We might not change that many people. Well, for heaven's sake, let's not start a new patient on brand name metformin, right? So that got fixed in Epic. They're trying this out at UCLA. You want to do this now? You got to go through two more approval screens. You ever read that book, Nudge? That's a big nudge, okay? You got to type in all this stuff. If you go that way, ah, I'm just going to go the easy way now, right? Boom, million dollars saved on just this one thing, okay? $1.1 million. Enormous teams doing this. It's not just the data. Right? From here to here, UC-wide, we can save a million dollars on just the one stupid drug. We're scaling to like 15 now over the next year here. Okay, really simple stuff. The drugs are actually going to be a very interesting direction. These are the five main UC campuses. Again, Riverside's tiny. They're left out. And these are top 10 drugs. I know it's blurry. I'm not going to show you the names of the drugs, okay? Uh, by design here, okay? We shouldn't really, we're a little sensitive here. So you see, uh, this is UCSF, UCLA, uh, San Diego, uh, Davis, and Irvine here. Each box here, you can barely see, is a different drug. Uh, and it's based on how much we charge for this drug, how much we've used the drug. Just to calibrate you, this entire box is $1.5 billion. Okay, So this is $1.5 billion of drug charges just last year. This is 2018 data. Uh, again, for the R01 types, that's the equivalent of an entire institute of NIH. Okay, like NCI is like one billion dollars. This is 1.5 billion dollars. Okay, so it's like an entire institute on one slide. Now, as you'd guess, most of these drugs, the expensive drugs, are what are called biologics, monoclonal antibodies. Okay, they're super expensive. You know, you got these, and you got those. So why on earth aren't they the same biologics? In certain categories, some of the medical folks might know, TNF-alpha, we got six choices. Why is UCLA using this one and UCSF using that one? Can we actually do the comparative effectiveness to figure out which is the best one to use? Why is everyone else afraid to do this or in, incapable of doing this? We don't even need a grant to do this, and believe me, we're not going to get a grant from the pharma companies to do this. It's our duty now to ask these kinds of questions. What is the right way to do this? What's the right cost-effective way to do this? Right? If we don't do this, nobody in the country is going to be able to do it at this point. Right? What, one little hospital at a time? We got 10 hospitals already counted in this system here. This, this are duties to ask these kinds of questions. Let me skip ahead a little bit here. Talk about how is research going to work here, right? What are we going to do with all this data? Well, as you can probably tell by the geocoding, you realize we have a fully identifiable database on one end. We're allowed to do that because it's for operational quality improvement. We also now have a, quote, legally de-identified version on the right end. So these are the bookends here. This, our goal, we will get to that goal, is going to be so de-identified, it's called non-human subjects research. You are not even going to need an IRB to get to that one, okay? You won't need to talk to an IRB. It's going to be mostly structured data. I already told you we're getting to de-identified notes, so we'll put that in images aspirationally at some point. Everything in between, if you need a zip code, if you need you know, the season or stuff like that, it's called limited data set IRBs, we'll work with you on that. You get everything to work on your campus first. Start to figure out where OMOP is on your campus. I'm going to show you a screenshot in a moment here. Get your queries working on OMOP, and OMOP is really the thing to learn. HODA is probably still an audience. All of us research cohort programs using OMOP. PCORI P scanner has been using OMOP. Everything is going around OMOP. You're going to want to learn OMOP. Then when you're ready to scale and authorize, you spin up a virtual machine. It'll be on Azure. You sign your firstborn child away if you do something evil with this data. Uh, even though it's de-identified, it's still competitively important data to us. Our Tableau, all the rest are going to be on there. Upload your scripts and run. You can't download the data. You can do whatever you want on the virtual machine. Save for spectral and regulated research use of all this data. By the way, we realized so few people were using OMOP uh, that we just realized there's actually no package in R on OMOP. So we created something we call R OMOP. You can literally go download. I think it's in. Uh, it's not a bioconductor, but it's on CRAN. CRAN. Uh, just uh, you can do package uh, install package R, R OMOP, and you'll get the whole data model now. Because we just want to get more data scientists, especially R folks. I know it's not in Python yet. We'll get that fixed as well. Uh, but at least the R folks can get there. So let me just end uh, in the last two minutes. Uh, let me skip ahead a couple of slides here and uh, uh, skip this part here, the fun part here. All right, what are we going to do with all this clinical data? There are 10 bullets here for all 10 campuses of UC. 
Right? I think we're going to go crazy. We're going to have patients certainly using their own data, community activists. So researchers might look at clusters of different diseases. Mobile health researchers will probably want to get data from patients. An app designer maybe will use all this data to inform patients with chronic disease a better way, what's forward, what's next. Uh, cancer genomics researchers should be able to get to all 11,000 cancer genomes we have now coming into the database. You know, 10 campuses, 10 different bullets here. All I'm trying to do uh, in my last minute, I'll tell you, is to build maps. Now, you've heard all about maps today. Everyone's been talking about maps today. Usually, i got to explain the concept of maps. Maybe you use maps like uh, Google Maps, right, or Waze. We talked about maps earlier, I think, before the lunch. My car makes me use Apple Maps, but it's getting better, let me tell you. Uh, I love learning maps from the data. And this is actually, Soren's really been influencing us like crazy in our lab. This is California data. There's a bioarchive at this link, and remember, all the slides will be available, don't worry. Here's an example from Californians. You know, you know how Google takes you to pleasant destinations? We're trying to figure out how you get diseases and die in California, okay? It's the opposite of Google Maps. So patients show up with alcoholism a year, each hour is a year. They show up with liver disease and cirrhosis a year after that, liver abscess. You can die of these two. It's really hard to die of alcoholism, but you can die of the complications, right? Here's a more interesting map we've learned from the data. Patients show up with heart attack. Everyone knows what a heart attack is. You can die right away, or you can end up with heart failure. It's a plague in our health system right now because the pump is broken. It's not gonna pump the blood the body needs. The fluid backs up in the lung, causing lung disease. And a whole bunch of folks are dying of sepsis. You've heard of sepsis today, many times now. Now, it's interesting. Three years after a heart attack, it's sepsis. Now, again, I'm a pediatrician. Didn't really take care of a bunch of patients with heart attacks. But I always thought if you had a heart attack, it was the heart that killed you. In the end, I'm amazed how many are dying of the infection. In the end, are we really screening folks at home if they have a high fever for sepsis after a heart attack? I'm not really sure we're doing that. That's because if you don't take the northern route, you can take the southern route, kill your kidneys, and end up with sepsis even a year earlier, right? So that's the idea of maps. Now, maps are great, and they tell you where you are, where you're going to go next. And that's a great concept, and I love Google Maps, but there's still one thing Google Maps can't do. Google Maps cannot show you where all the cars are on the map. I know it shows you the traffic, red, yellow, green, but there's no way for it to show all the cars on the map. But when we open our new building at UCSF, and we'll be opening many new buildings if all goes well in this field, we're gonna have these walls of monitors like you're used to in Cal IT2, and not just have the maps, but have where are all our patients on the map. This is literally, as Californians get older, this is literally how they move from disease to disease to disease to death. A whole bunch of them are gonna get sepsis now and die in a moment. There they go. <laughs> Everyone chuckles, don't worry. But the whole point now as a health system is to predict what's gonna happen in the next 90 days, what's gonna happen in the next year, and what are we gonna do about it? And that to me is gonna be the new definition of an accountable care organization, one that knows how to account for the care of all 15 million of its patients. And that's what I'm proud of building with all of you in the University of California. So what is AI and biomedicine in the end? Is it about algorithms, programs, databases, cloud computing, high-performance computers, and mobile? Yeah, it's kind of about all of these. It's about predicting diseases before they strike, explaining rare diseases that defy experts, finding drugs for diseases that lack attention, they're not enough pharma companies on the planet, we gotta do our part. Making sure we do the right, safe, cost-effective thing for patients, all of this is an amazing platform for innovation and entrepreneurship. I'm gonna sum all this up with one word, hope. The patients, the docs, the families are counting on us. They're counting on you to do this. There are not enough companies out there. It's not taboo to talk about companies. If something works in your lab, get it out of academia. UC loves it when you do that, but everyone's counting on you to do it, and you're getting all this data for free today. I would thank an enormous number of people across the University of California who make this data warehouse happen. I used to color code them by campus. Now I realize we are all one giant university, just in different zip codes. Enormous number of collaborators across UC campuses, as well as uh, uh, Stanford, my old days, and, UC and uh, NIH. If you haven't had too enough about AI, I'm gonna make a plug for our symposium coming up next month over in Luskin at UCLA, the first UC-wide AI meeting now. Now we got some keynotes, Suji Sari from Hopkins, Jeff Dean Gulei, Wendy Nelson, but no one else outside of UC invited, okay? It's an open, safe environment for all of us to share with each other what exactly we're doing and how do we get this tide to raise all the boats. 
415 people already signed up to come from all 10 campuses, including Riverside and Merced is sending folks now, okay? We got 415 people. It's growing every hour because today is the last day to submit an abstract, okay? We got leadership meeting on the second day, and let's see if we can come up with some kind of proposal to Janet and others on a UC-wide and by medicine to help all of our efforts on our, all of our campuses. Let's get system-wide dollars to help launch everything that we're doing. I thank enormous number of people for support, uh, and endowment support. I, I'm blessed with 20 NIH grants from these 11 institutes of NIH. The ones in red give me more money, the ones in orange give me less money, but I still love them. <laughs> All these deceased specific foundations, I thank my admin tech staff wherever I go. Uh, Zach has been my friendly mentor for life. Uh, Sam, Keith, uh, Talmadge, Mark, and Jack Strobel, who runs UC Health, keep me uh, busy. I always thank my family. They let me go all over the world to give talks like this. Thank you very much.